So Senator, welcome to the Space Telescope Science Institute. We're absolutely delighted that you're with us today, honored that you're with us today. And when I say with us, I mean not only the people in this room, but the people in all of the other STSCI buildings who are watching this remotely. We don't have enough room in this building anymore to fit everybody in, so um, we have people down in the Steve Silver building watching, people over in the Rotunda, others even in this building watching remotely, um, people over in the Bloomberg Center for Physics and Astronomy across the street at Hopkins, and so uh, we're all watching and, and delighted that you're here. <laughs> delighted that you're here. Um, Thanks. So uh, in addition to the people that you see in this room, I want to I wanna welcome a few others um, because uh, it's not often that we get a chance to get such an auspicious group of people together. And uh, you've given us a great opportunity to connect with some people here. So I'd like to um, welcome uh, Matt Mountain, President of Aura. And um, is Ron Daniels here from Hopkins? No. But um, uh, Beverly Wendlands here from Hopkins, uh, dean, of the, dean of the JHU Krieger School of Arts and Sciences. And um, Robert Lieberman is here, JHU Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'd also like to welcome um, our Goddard colleagues. Uh, geez, there are lots of you here. Uh, John Grunsfeld, uh, for, now former NASA. Uh, Associate Administrator, and Jeff Yoder taking his place. And Jeff, welcome. We hope that you'll come back and visit us again soon. Uh, Eric Smith, the James Webb Program Director at NASA Headquarters, thank you. Uh, from Goddard, uh, Colleen Hartman, the Goddard Deputy Director for Science. Colleen? Oh, Colleen didn't make it. Uh, but George Morrow is here, the Goddard uh, Deputy Director uh, for Projects and Operations. Um, I'd also like to make sure that, uh, Senator, you know there are two Nobel Prize winners in the room who wanted to see you today. Uh, that's at, what's that? I feel the vibe. You feel the vibe, yes, that's good. Uh, Dr. Adam Reese, right behind you, uh, sneaking up on you from the back there. And John Mather on the side of the room over there. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as you can see, we love you. And we're, um, we're so thankful for the, everything that you've done for us here at the Institute, for our colleagues that I've just mentioned and their institutions, for Maryland, and for this great nation of ours. Um, we're going to miss you in the role that you've been playing, but we're hoping to see a lot of you in the coming years. As I was saying to you earlier today, um, so many people in this room have had their lives touched by the work that you've done. And um, I'm a prime example of that. I am a product of Hubble. I was in the early classes of Hubble Fellows. I built my scientific career on using data from Hubble and other observatories whose data are archived in your archive. Uh, I thank you for that. I came to the Institute knowing that it was a great place to be, that there was an excitement here that you just can't find elsewhere. And I've been here for 15 years. And so the reason I'm standing up here today is because of you. And you could ask any of the other people in this room, and I'm sure that they could give you a very similar story. And it's not just us, it's thousands of people across the country. So thank you. James Webb is going to be an absolutely amazing observatory, the most powerful observatory ever built. It's going to show us galaxies and stars forming at the beginning of time. And it's going to give us a chance to do comparative planetology from planets in our own solar system to planets surrounding other stars. It's going to show us things that we haven't even thought of yet. And so for that, and that all of that will entail, we couldn't do that without the dedication of large teams of people with strong leaders. It seems appropriate that today we're talking about dedicating the Mission Operations Center, which you just saw upstairs and which is shown on the room uh, monitors here. And we would be delighted if you would help us dedicate that room today by cutting this ribbon in front of you. 
I'd like to ask uh, John Durning, the, project, the deputy project uh, manager for James Webb at Goddard, and Massimo Stiavelli, our, HST, or our uh, JWST mission head here at the Institute, to come forward. And I'm going to give you a very big <laughs> pair of scissors. <laughs> and I'm going to stand back. <laughs> but would you come around front? Come around. Yes, please. And that, that Usually I'm fighting people who want to do this to the budget. Uh, <laughs> I don't need to do this part of it. That ribbon is all yours to cut as you see fit. Well, how about if we do a countdown starting with five and going All right. She okay. wants a countdown, folks. Five, five four, four, three, two, two one. Get you to say some remarks. This is a big podium. <laughs> big people here at the Space Telescope Institute. Well, good morning, everybody. It's so great to be back here uh, at the Space Telescope Institute, where I have been on so many occasions to get briefings and updates to see how we could be moving our study of astronomy and space forward to be able to be at dedications here and to be at your fabulous, fabulous Halloween parties. <laughs> uh, and um, been mesmerized by not only the dazzling science that you do, but those outfits are pretty cool uh, themselves. Uh, I don't quite have the geometry to be Princess Leah, though she's getting a little older too. Uh, and, uh, but it's been fun. You might recall at the last party I came as dark energy. I, I thought it'd be the spirit of the times. And <laughs> so, but it's a great to be back once again to see all of you, to get an update on what you're doing now and to talk about what is going to ha be happening here in the future uh, in terms of what we're doing with the Hubble and what we plan to do uh, with the James Webb Telescope. Uh, Dr. Sembach, we want to thank you for your wonderful words and a warm introduction. Uh, certainly, John uh, Grunsfeld, we welcome you back. We know that you've left NASA, uh, but we know that you don't leave your advocacy for the American Space Program, and uh, we look forward to working with you. You know, we old retirees, you'll always, there'll be sightings that the Hopkins Club or anything else that warms the heart and soothes the spirit. Um, and of course, there are so many other people here, but who else would have two Nobel Prize winners in the room? Dr. John Mather from Goddard uh, and, uh, and also our Dr. Adam Reese, who named a supernova after me. <laughs> when I... When I became the longest serving woman uh, in Congress, they wanted to name something. So some of my colleagues have a post office named after them. I said, I don't want anything that's going to be closed. Uh, <laughs> they had a highway named after them. I said, why would I want to be run over? Um, and so up came, you know, the dashing Dr. Adam Reese with the idea of a, of a supernova. There is no other senator that's had a supernova named after him. So eat your heart out, John Glenn. So, uh, but it wasn't just, I mean, that was just a wonderful honor. But that same day, Matt Mountain, who was here then for the Space Telescope Institute, named the Space Telescope uh, Archives after me. And that meant so much to me because this is really the digital library for all of the work of all of the space telescopes in all of the world, all right here at this incredible repository of astronomical knowledge and legacy.
And what's so fabulous about that is we will, in a very short few years, be looking at what James Webb will be doing that day and can look at what the pictures are from Hubble are doing that were taken today and be able to look out over all of these fabulous, fabulous space, space uh, t what the space telescopes have done. We're very proud of all of you in this room. Much is being said about what I did, but I'm here really to talk about you. I want you to know that I'm very proud of you. I am so proud of the work that we have done together. You know, behind me, there's a whole lot of we, and I wouldn't be a me if there wasn't a we. The we is really what you have done every day in every way through ups and downs to make sure that America be, continues to be the premier country in astronomy, but not for xenophobic reasons, but the fact to be able to lead the way and bring other nations with us in a common understanding and a common goal to study what is our common heritage to study the universe. And I've been just really proud of getting to know each and every one of you on my many visits, from the astrophysicist poring over the computer screen, looking at all those dots, and I, you know, all those dots, and all those dots mean something. All those, and talk about connecting the dots, you really do do it. I mean, that's what's so phenomenal. But from the astrophysicist to the computer scientist to the facility manager that keeps all the lights on and keep it working, to the cafeteria, with that wonderful cafeteria you have, which I might add is some of the best food uh, in Baltimore, and so on. We wanted to thank you for what you do, because you have really and just continued to lead the way. And then there's also the Space Telescope uh, Library, which shares it from 12 space observatories. And what is so fantastic is that what you've done here with all of your work, we give it away to the world. And I've said this before when I was here, and I say it everywhere I go. You know, a rich nation can build a space telescope, but a great nation gives the information to the world. And that's what America is all about. Science, discovery, exploration, but then sharing it with the world to improve the world, to improve our knowledge, to improve our understanding, to take us in our thinking where we hadn't done it going before. And as we study pure science, we also then look at the possibilities for coming up with the new ideas for the new jobs. And you should feel very proud of what you've done. Now, I go back a long way to this place. When I was a young congresswoman, um, like really young, uh, <laughs> I think they just finished doing Mount Rushmore or something. Anyway, <laughs> uh, my predecessor, Senator Mac, Charles Mack Mathias, who was a very close friend of Steve Muller, uh, and Senator Mathias in the Senate was also on the Appropriations Committee, that they then talked about the idea, as did then NASA, of this fantastic idea of a Space Telescope Institute. And I remember being in the House of Representatives, Senator Mathias then in the Senate with Senator Sarbanes, um, and coming with Steve Muller to a major announcement where they said, we're going to have a Space Telescope Institute here at the Dell. Well, I saw this as like Matt Palmer, you know, the big thing with the dome and that opened <laughs> up and you have parties and <laughs> I was all for it. Um, <laughs> And when they talked about the Space Telescope Institute, this was in the 1980s. And as they say, who knew? Who knew that the great work that was going on then at NASA to envision the idea that Senator Mathias was an advocate that had come to be on the campus of Johns Hopkins University, that there would be a unique relationship between the Space Telescope Institute and NASA, independent, but yet linked to, and also with the great thinking that was going on 
and the storied history of the physics department here at Hopkins. And out of that, with dirt in the ground, we watch it rise. And then it looked like this. So I said, what is this? This is not a space telescope. <laughs> you know, this isn't what I saw. This wasn't where I was coming for a New Year's Eve party. <laughs> what, is, what is this? What is this? Because it looked like just one more building. Little did I know what was going on. And then it became my turn to become a United States senator. And when I won the election and went to see Senator, uh, senator Mathias, he said, I wish you well, and I hope you consider following on some of the things I've worked on. International arms control. He was a non-nuclear proliferator. Number two, protecting the environment. He was a founder of the Chesapeake Bay Program, then with Governor Hughes. Also standing up for civil rights. He was a Republican who was a deciding vote on many of the key issues, remembering the Lincoln legacy. And then he said, and also, don't forget science. You represent some of the greatest universities in America. We have the Space Telescope Institute. I hope you take a particular interest in it. Well, I wish he were with me here today. God rest his soul. So I've tried to do that and then got to know you. Little did I know what I would find. The spectacular work all that was going in. And when the Hubble launched, my heart was in my mouth. I couldn't wait for that Hubble to go up. And then it went up in the space and we were waiting and then it couldn't call home. It couldn't call home. I said, oh my gosh, what was going to happen? And then we all went to work. And this is where, in addition, when we talk about rocket ships, there's another ship that I think takes us into the future. And that's called bipartisanship. The ship of bipartisanship. I teamed up with then Senator Jake Garn, a Republican from Utah, who was the co-chair of the funding for the space program, and then also involved Senator John Glenn. I was a brand new senator. People didn't know me, and I didn't know the space program. But I had Glenn, and I had Garn. They were fantastic teachers. They brought enormous credibility to what they did because they were fabulous senators from their state, and they were also astronaut senators. And then working across party lines, using the expertise of these two fabulous great men who were pioneers in their own way, teaming up with a woman who had broken a barrier of becoming the first woman to come to the Senate, but we wanted the first space telescope to really work. And out of that came the fantastic Hubble repair mission. Well, you know the rest is history. Five missions for repair, one where they didn't want to do it again, one they were going to cancel it. I asked for a second opinion. Well, I insisted on a second opinion. <laughs> so while you were daring, I was determined not to be dainty. And out of that came that, and of course, here we are later, 26 years later. Launched in April of 1990, it's looked at 38,000 objects. It's made one, more than one million observations. It's rewritten the astronomy textbooks. It contributed to winning the Nobel Prize. And of course, Dr. Riccardo Giacconi, the founder, the fa one of the first one, was also himself a Nobel Prize winner. The astronauts, in their daring, fixed the Hubble five times. Hubble has been a frequent flyer, 140,000 trips around our planet. 3.8 billion miles. The numbers go on and on. But it's not about the numbers. It is about the science that's been done. And in addition to the great science that you study every single day and that you study, that you share with the world, you've been an educator and an ambassador. When it looked like we were canceling the Hubble, school children around America started a Save the Hubble campaign. They actually started making contributions. Little children in Australia took up a collection so that we would have the money to fix it. It's not to demean our country. It was the passion that little children had to save the Hubble. You know, the Hubble has its own website 
and it's get messages. It gets messages from children that are heart wrenching. Do you see what an angel looks like? Do you talk to God? My mother passed away. Have you seen her? I mean, really touching and then beautiful ones. And then along the way, the scientist over at Goddard, in collaboration with you, teamed up with the Smithsonian. And what did they do? They knew that one of the challenges was, how do you help blind children become engaged in science? And it was those scientists working on the Hubble, teaming, with, te teaming up with the Smithsonian Institute, helped do a Braille textbook for middle schoolers in astronomy. And it's called Touch the Invisible Sky. Wow, doesn't that bring tears to your eyes? It certainly did to mine. And though it cost $75,000 to invent it and initially produce it, I convinced him to add a million dollars more to science when I got my colleagues to get as choked up as I did. So <laughs> we have been working on this, but today is not about talking about the past. It's also talking about the future. And we're now looking at the James Webb, the successor to Hubble. I was glad to cut the ribbon. I was glad to go to the control center. I was happy to be over at Goddard to see what it's doing. It's been identified as the highest priority for astronomers uh, that we can do now. It will be launched in 2018, and it will go and see where no telescope has been done before. All of this has been because we work together. And this is what your government and we need to do together. We need to all be on the same side. And this today is not about savoring the past, to let you know that I'm fighting here right now. As we go through this year's appropriation cycle, I've got, I've got life in me as well. The Hubble's going to keep going, going, and so am I. <laughs> I'm going to keep on doing my job like the Hubble's doing it and like you are. So in this year's appropriation, we hope to put in 98 to $100 million for the continued functioning of the Hubble. We're also going to continue to fund the ongoing construction of the James Webb Telescope at the tune of $580 million. We're going to finish the, the web, as we said. And we're also going to continue our work in dark energy with the W-First telescope, which we know our colleague, Dr. Bennett, is also working on right here in this area. And then we also want to keep NASA in the science education business. That's what we're going to continue. So we're fighting today for what we need to be able to do. So, old telescopes don't die, but they don't want to be space junk either. And I'm not going to fade away, and I'm not going to be space junk either. You know, I'm going to continue to live in Baltimore. I'm going to continue to be four blocks away. I live in a condo. I don't have a telescope, but I do have binoculars. <laughs> <laughs> and bifocals, and continue to be involved. And so I want you to know that what I want to continue to do is to stand up for the future. This is what I think we need to do. We need to work today, savor the past, do our best today, and then stand up for the future. I want to devote myself, and I ask all of you, to stand up for the future, to stand up for science. We need reliable, definite, funding for science and discovery in the federal budget and reward the tax code for those who are willing to do the daring, to do the do, to imagine the yet that which we can't even think about, to stand up for science. And number one, do no harm, no sequesters, no shutdown, to guarantee predictability that when you sign up with your career or sign up for that student debt, you know that there's something waiting for you where you can put your heart, your soul, your mind, your God-given talents in. And out of that, make an enormous contribution to our country. We need to stand up for science and not mess with science. The other is we have to stand up for scientists. Number one, the Congress should never subpoena scientists to testify. 
I was outraged that a NOAA scientist who had been working on climate change was drawn into, subpoenaed, and to be harassed because of scientific data. We cannot have a scientific McCarthyism in the United States of America. Science is to be to take you where science is supposed to go. And then for the young investigators, those who are in this room, those who are watching, maybe even those that are in middle school as we're talking right this minute or elementary school, or in scouts working on a project or after school activities, we need to make sure that they have an opportunity. We need to make sure that first of all, we need to do something about college affordability. You should not have to go into such enormous debt to be able to seek higher education, to be able to go to graduate school, and to be able to do that. This is why I feel that one of our number one priorities should be to make higher education affordable at the undergraduate level, affordable or even free at the graduate school level so that people can get on with it so that our country can continue to get ahead. And then last but not at all least, we have to look out for those little boys and girls that right now are using the Hubble data. Because the scientist really begins as a young child. It sure began for me. When I was about nine years old, and it was the close of World War II, my parents, who wanted me to know my Polish heritage, took me to see a movie about Madame Curie. And it was played by the famous Greer Garson. She won a Nobel Prize for that, and the dashing Walter Pigeon. I loved it. I was crazy about it. When I came home, I wanted a chemistry set. I wanted to be the next Madame Curie, a little Polish girl. I was all set to go off and discover great new things, win a Nobel Prize, and I didn't know about the Frenchman part, but that sounded good too. <laughs> and as I did scientists, when I started both high school and then undergraduate school, I was thinking very definitely about a career in science. I went to a local Catholic women's college, Mount St. Agnes. It's since merged with Loyola University. But guess what I found? I found that I was klutzy in it. And then my rendezvous with organic chemistry was not a happy one. <laughs> and I found that I just wasn't good about it, but I do remember Boyle's gas laws. And it's been very helpful as a senator. Gas takes the size and shape of its container. <laughs> There are some things that are just important in life from what you learn. <laughs> but what I came away with is I then changed to social science. You know my story. A social worker fighting a highway took me into politics and took me where I am today. When I embarked, when I was that little girl working in the basement of our little row house in Highland Town, I never knew that I would be here today with all of you, that I would actually know Nobel Prize winners and be on a first name basis. And it's that great honor, but in addition to that. But what I did know was even though I wasn't good at science, I had a passion for science in what it meant, what it meant to mankind, what it actually meant to be transformational to mankind. So I realized that my job was not to be a scientist, but to help scientists be scientists, to help scientists be scientists. And so therefore, when I went to the Senate and went on the Appropriations Committee, I made as my very top priority from day one to work on science, whether it was the National Institutes of Health, of Health known as the National Institutes of Hope, to be able to be involved with the space program, to take up the encouragement that Senator Mathias left with me to encourage me to get started, to the welcoming on this campus and at Goddard, Wallops, and so on, that it was my job to help you be you. And guess what? You have been. So for all the pictures I've looked at, at all the discoveries that I have, my greatest discovery 
has been you. My greatest discovery has been you. How duty-driven you are, how focused you are in improving the very nature of humankind. I am so proud of you, and I just want to say, may the force always be with you. <laughs> <laughs>